Welcome to the heart of a matter. My name is Abisi. And I'm Omotayo. And we're here with Mr. Sheo Akisomi, the man of many talents, photographer, <laughs> writer, I would say an inspirational speaker as well. He has such an amazing story yes. and we're going to go through the entire thing. He has this book here called Tears of a Hungry Nigerian Entrepreneur, which is like, like he said, 20 years summarized. Mm. <laughs> ups and downs and ups again. Tears. So yeah, so we want to, in this episode, kind of really go into mm. that story. Well, as much as possible in 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, and then you're going to ask about the book, so... <laughs> so I'm the first of five children. I'm okay. uh, born to uh, someone I considered my number one role model, my dad and my mom, a banker. Uh, I wanted to, you know, grow up to be like my dad. He was an accountant. And, you know, growing up, I eventually got into commercial department, secondary school. And I think eventually I wanted to become an accountant, so he got me an extra lesson teacher that was teaching me maths. And eventually <laughs> maths was the only class that I got, you know, an A in, in YEC. And uh, I think I got a fair enough result for him to believe in me enough to send me to a university in America, Southern Illinois University. And it wasn't until my third year that I realized that Accounting perhaps wasn't for me. I remember taking one class called financial accounting and I had to eventually take that class twice. But I discovered that I had this entrepreneurial, you know, spirit within me. Whenever there was a challenge or a problem, I saw an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So if maybe the dollar is going up anyhow, I saw how, wow, what if I start a business in dollars? You know, I could make more money. So <laughs> started by, you know. How do you have an interest in entrepreneurship without having an interest in accounting. How does, so, it, yeah. how does it work? You no, know, so I think I was focused more on, I just want to be like my dad. My dad, growing up, he would leave the house 5 a.m. to go to work and come back 12 midnight. Wow. And I thought that was great, that this man is having fun. Me too, when I grow up, I want to leave the house 5 a.m., <laughs> you know. So the real act of accounting, uh, when I got to third day, I realized it was actually not a creative process. In accounting, one plus one must equal two. The day it equals three, you are going to prison. As an entrepreneur, as a creative person, you could wake up, especially as a photographer, and say one plus one is 11. And you know, you'll find a client that will be like, wow, that's true, <laughs> you know. So I found out that I was more fulfilled as a creative person than you know, an accountant. So I eventually, I just had to you know, do the switch. Of course, I made a lot of mistakes, you know, along the way, especially because I wasn't guided. And I think my first company was one in which uh, most people believe they have challenges when they are not making money in their business. For me, I was making so much money, I was close to buying a Mercedes-Benz 600 SEL. Imagine as a 20 year old, I mean, my oh. pastor was in financial <laughs> need, I wanted to buy his car. So uh, was but, this when you were still in your third year or after? Uh, that was my third year. Okay. So, so your third year when you started your first business, wow. you made yeah. so much money yes. that you were, okay. 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 So basically, you know, a summary of the business was my school uh, actually changes textbooks every maybe two semester. And maybe a textbook is $40. By the time a new edition comes out, they do what they call the $1 sale. So even a book is $100, they would, you know, sell everything away for $1. And I figured, wow. America is so big that I'm sure there are like 100 other schools that will still need this school. So if I buy it for $1, I could sell it for $20 yeah. and still make money. You know, and you know, that's, we call the company textbookforless.com. Partnered with Amazon.com, Yahoo, mm -hmm. and eBay. And you know, on Amazon platform, it was really, really selling. So, wow. but my challenge was the fact that you could be running a business and making so much money and you're actually not progressing. You think you're doing well. You know, because some of the decisions that comes with managing so much money, uh, you need to be guided. And mm. I was misguided by myself, and eventually I landed up in like four prisons in America. Okay, wait, wait. How how did that happen? Okay. Uh, your business. Uh, I think 
what the structure I was trying to build was what uh, Jumia is presently doing. My goal was to be as big as uh, Amazon.com. So we started, you know, with books. And in an attempt to expand to electronics and all that, I partnered with one guy that said, okay, what was raving then was not iPhone, was Palm yeah. Tom. Oh, Palm, I, yeah. So I don't the even Palm, know that is a yeah. Palm 5 or something yeah, like so that. Palm 4 just came out then. <laughs> And the retail price was like $300. And I got this supplier that was saying, look, I could supply you for $200. And, and that was my first experience realizing that when something seems too good to mm. be true, mm. it's probably too good yes. to be true. So I, you know, ordered like a dozen from him, you know, almost resold it immediately, took people's money. And then immediately I paid him. There was online transfer, you know, back in 1999, 2000. Immediately I clicked send. Someone else sent me a message that I saw that you are bidding from one guy. Uh, I hope you know he's a fraud. Mm. And the money had gone, the people that paid me money was chasing me, where's my money, where's my whatever, I couldn't, you know, deliver. And in America, when someone reports you to the police, mm -hmm. it's only a matter of time. So they reported me and uh, eventually, because America is so big, the police eventually got a hold of me like six Were months later. <laughs> Not that I was running away, you know, I just, yeah. somewhere in my head, I was like, oh, I'll refund them, I'll refund them. Mm. But I probably should have, you know, done that, you know, sooner. Mm -hmm because uh, they found me because I registered with uh, eBay with my university email address, mm -hmm. O-Akison at SIU. So, you know, they eventually traced me and, you know, mm -hmm. that began my journey in the American prison system, which interestingly enough was the most interesting part mm -hmm. of my stay in U.S. because wow. of the people I met, yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, please, can we hear more about that? Because we don't expect to meet someone who has been in prison, who's having an, a well-rounded yeah. life, and much less someone who says that that's the most interesting part because of the people that he met. So, mm -hmm. But even before then, just, what's it like in prison in America? Because we joke around in Nigeria that, yeah. ah, at least they give you food, at least it's better than this or this or that. Like, what, what's it actually like? like in your mind, the people around you, the hardships, we only watch it, we only see them in movies. Like, and you don't, you don't know what it's like mm -hmm. watching the movie. So mm -hmm. I watch a movie like Prison Break and I'm like, I could feel Schofield, mm -hmm. you know, have you? Yes. And uh, I think it started for me, I became born again before I traveled to US and running the business, eventually some of my values became, you know, started getting eroded, you know, integrity, honesty, because when so much money is, you know, in your face, you know, mm -hmm. you think you're a, truthful guy, you know, <laughs> you know, you are standing a little lie. Just, and mm. I was in the leadership of my church. Uh, for some people, mm. it might be hard to believe, but I was in the choir. And, you know, my choir leader told me I was a tenor. And so I realized I was, you know, as if you weren't yeah, I didn't know all those, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I found myself, one of the major skeletons I now had in my cupboard was also pornography. Mm. So it was a big uh, toggle for me, singing, leading people in worship and somewhere in my head in some of the praise worship i would be crying and some people would be like wow the presence of god is moving <laughs> and in my head i'm like you know i have all these skeletons you know i prayed you know three words i still remember god messed me up and i mean it was a heartfelt prayer and you know ending up in prison was like an answer to that prayer because it was like a you know resetting mode when you get to prison there's nothing like i'm too busy to to mm. pray, you know, yeah. you, you find God in prison. And uh, by the time I got there, I realized that there were many people that were in my shoes too, that uh, every one of us, even if you were, uh, quote, innocent, you ending up in prison, if you look at the whole situation right, it was God that wanted you there because he wanted your attention. And mm. did he get my attention? And I found out that I was... Uh, uh, we actually started a fellowship in prison, you know. My role model in prison, it was the reason I actually started expressing myself, you know, in, in words. Uh, Donald Starr is his name. Uh, as at 2001, he was a 40-year-old uh, American that was in prison for cocaine. And, you know, you know, he gave his life to Christ again in the prison. And 
it was a fulfilling experience for me meeting him meeting others another guy is you know close to god i mean very few people i've met that will say they hear god they talk with god mm -hmm. and this guy was like oh god why did you allow my daughter to die you know you know i've been serving and god was like now you know how i feel how mm, i felt wow. when my son you know wow. and then so it was really really fun knowing the different people i met and it was the most humbling experience mm. i think to a large extent uh, when you've been through prison for most people you shouldn't be as proud as the average guy that hasn't you know probably mm. been through so sometimes when people just talk or complain about government or i just look at them mm. there, most of the time mm. you know better you know if you know maybe how god is working you just keep quiet mm. you, won't, you know so it was yeah. interesting yeah can i just say that with I don't know how it was then, but now I know with the whole mass incarceration prison system in America, it's like, it's just so degrading. Like you can't vote, you can't do this. So I just want to know what it was like for you. Like you can talk more of your experiences in prison, but coming out and then like that transformation, what was it like? Okay, uh, first of all, interesting, American prisons is actually, they treat you well. Yeah. I mean, one memory that sticks to me is the fact that after they give you lunch, Somewhere between lunch and dinner, they serve you cookies. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> it was really interesting. But for me, knowing that I was the first of five children, mm -hmm. and I was probably the eldest in my generation, my family, now being the first to be deported, because mm -hmm. that's what, you know, I, in fact, it was a letter I had to write to the American government after the September 11. I was like, you guys have held me for so long. Just send me back if you want to. So they replied, okay, we'll be sending you back. Wow. You know, and then getting to the airport, you know, deported, witnessing what uh, was written about that prodigal son. Hmm. You know, my father hmm. was waiting at the airport and wow. he gave me probably the warmest hug I can probably wow. still remember, you know, till today. I think uh, by the time I came back, I rededicated myself, you know, to to God, uh, I I pray that, you know, this Christianity thing, I don't want to just be an anyhow Christian, uh, that God should lead me in the right church, you know, to go. Wow, wow. We actually have to go on a quick break, but uh, I'm sure you are just as interested in knowing the rest of the story as we are, so stay tuned and we'll be right back. Child, when you are weary, hold my hand. Run to me. I am your father and I love you. It is your time of manifestation. Welcome back to the heart of the matter. We're back with Mr. Sheo Akisomi and he's sharing, wow, an incredible story of, um, it's, it's so much, <laughs> it's so <laughs> still much. processing. Yeah. But now coming back from America, being in prison back in Nigeria and really being transformed and getting back to entrepreneurship, what was that journey like from that? A message that still, you know, comes strongly in my mind was that day when the pastor was preaching, uh, starting with what you have. And it was a matter of, okay, what next for me? And it was like, uh, what is it that you enjoy doing that? Even if you are not paid, you will still want to do it. For me, it was two things. IT, I was good at IT and I was good at uh, photography because I started taking pictures while I was in school. Mm -hmm. And I settled for photography and uh, for me, I realized that there was no school to actually learn this. I mean, I was a deported, whatever. My parents can't afford to invest in me again because they are not sure if this guy <laughs> will disappoint again. So I started, you know, by reading books. 
Yeah, I ought mm -hmm. to have started reading books, even mm -hmm. you know, running the company. So for me, I got a role model from afar mm -hmm. in the name Kelechi Amadiobi. That guy is, is old, He's man. Okay. I mean, as far back as 2002, I was you know, reading his stuff in magazine and what he was doing. And then I got a far role model and one close by, one in my church. Two, actually, one that uses Nikon, another uses Canon. Because <laughs> I wasn't about to start a journey that I would, you know, fall, you know, flat again. And then I was reading voraciously because I wanted to stand out. So I chose photography. And uh, I remember, you know, I, rem I actually went to study accounting, right? So eventually I was able to shall get the certificate. And <laughs> my dad called me for a meeting. Okay, so as an accountant, you know what you're going to do tomorrow? Go to ICANN office, get the form. And that would be the first time in my life that I'll tell my dad no. Mm. And then he was like, what do you mean no? I said, you know, I said, I want to be a photographer. And I remember him saying, Photokini, you know, because 2003, 2004, <laughs> photographer yeah. was in. But this man, called Samadhi Emi, was telling me, look, that stuff inside you that you are passionate <laughs> about, even if the world doesn't. I think for me, the fact that I found a Kelechi Amadi will be one person doing it. Mm -hmm. It was enough for me. I eventually started a photography school because many people was, you know, coming to me, uh, mm -hmm. searching, how do I do this? Many older people, really. And, you know, that journey led me to, okay, eventually starting the photography conference. In fact, the photography conference was, was one of those things that uh, for every major disappointment I go through, there's a way I uh, create an opportunity out of it. So there's this photography conference, Photokina, happens in Germany every two years. I applied uh, 2012 and the German embassy denied me and basically what they wrote to paraphrase was like you don't look like somebody that will come back to Nigeria mm -hmm. and in a way you couldn't blame them because the average person and I was angry. I was angry because you had denied my visa. I saw it. You had denied it like five days earlier but you still made me wait five hours just to get my passport back. Mm -hmm. And it was there I just made the decision. Me too, I'll do a conference that all over the world people will come, you know, and then I see only Germany that can do conference. <laughs> so that's how we started Nigerian Photography Expo and Conference 2013. And, you know, we've done six editions, you know. So having that space and bringing people together, young and old, I'll say what transformations have you seen or do you expect to see, I guess specifically in photography, but in creative entrepreneurship as a whole? Okay, uh, for me, one of the things I've been blessed with is uh, uh, an unusual amount of foresight that it can sometimes be ridiculed when I share with people. Me being in photography, someone still asked me yesterday, why am I in photography? I see myself as the official photographer of Jesus Christ when he comes back to reign for a thousand years, you know, sometime in the future. So that's my end game. So I rewind back, like in you know. The, sorry, because I'm, I'm, I'm so in there. So <laughs> yeah. like when the new the old heaven and old earth pass away and then the new heaven and new earth come and God and Jesus is like I need a photographer like that's you we already we already settled that discussion you know because it's picture oh, yeah. in every organization just of like course you see, just the same and way someone has to take it you know and so for me I know that's the end game you know rewind back you know I need to have at least raised and influenced as many people mm -hmm. you know as possible to ensure that okay I probably won't be the only photographer and the world maybe to use is creative, you know, mm. creative person because photography is just a medium. Well, we can see it evolving, yeah. you know, as time goes on. So for me, you know, the goal is now to make sure I raise as many as possible. The figure in my head right now is a million, yeah. uh, especially to get to that level of perfection in, you know, expressing themselves without making as many mistakes that I have made. And that's one reason why I've been able to work with a lot of people that have succeeded in the industry. I couldn't have done it alone. Working yeah. with the T.Y. Bello, uh, Kelechi Amadi and people, some people ask me, ah, how much did you pay all these people? I'm like, it's, it's friendship. I yeah. had to deliberately, mm. they are not perfect. Some of them have, you know, issues, but relating with them is like eating, you know, a steak of fish. You don't throw everything in your mouth. It's only cartoons that they throw yeah, fish they and then they remove it. the bone. Yeah. No, in real life, you separate the flesh, eat the flesh, and but partnering with all of them, I uh, know that in the future there will be a scenario in which everyone will be fulfilled with whatever avatar of creativity that you have, and especially the ability to manage the business side of it, because that's my area of passion now. You are mm -hmm. a creative person, 
you need to make money while you are alive and not be like a Beethoven that is mm. richer when they died <laughs> yeah. than when they are alive, you yeah. know. And the Picassos and all those people. Yeah. I think the ex humbling experience I had in prison uh, helped me to probably be more humble and realize that, look, a lot of what I had gone through, many people don't have to go through the same thing, especially people that are humble enough to ask. Uh, it's been adventurous. Uh, that's the word, adventurous. It's interesting you talking about people who are humble enough to ask. Yes. And um, also what you were saying even before we started about not having the right role models. Mm. But then at the same time, you have this close relationship with your dad and you have this church leadership. How come in the middle of that, because I know a lot of people are surrounded by structures like that, your dad, your uncle, your church, or your office. But there was still a, a lack of that role model thing. How, how come you weren't able to just, I don't know, turn to your pastor or turn to okay, somebody? Okay, so I think it's important to have a role model, a stroke mentor mm. in every major aspect of your life. So right. for my church, my pastor, uh, Pastor Crab, I, I was like the adopted son because they've been married for about 20 years, no child, you know, American. So I was this Nigerian guy that was, you know, I was, you know, a worker. Mm. Uh, for Christianity, they were my role model. For mm. maybe integrity, my dad, I respected him for, but for running a business, yes. I did not have, you know, a yeah. guide, a role model. And it was an irony because I was selling all these books, but I wasn't reading them. You know, for me, it was just to make money. Mm. So, you know, if I were to go back, you know, in the future, the past right now, I would have realized, okay, books like, okay, maybe start with what you have or, Phil mm -hmm. Collins, some of these books on managing, you know, businesses would have right. helped lead, you know, solid structures for me and importance of growing, you know, steadily and knowing how to manage, you know, funds. So I think the important thing is to realize that you need a role model in every major yeah. aspect. What I have noticed right now, because right now, you know, I've been married is for many people, they have role models when it comes to Christianity or being a good Christian, but you mm -hmm. don't have a role model for being a good husband mm. and then you, you are surprised when you get home one day and realize your wife has left you or your husband has left. I mean you didn't have a role model that was telling you the truth. And just in that vulnerability I want to know firstly how you dealt with criticisms and how you moved on from that as well. Okay uh, um, I was 41 a few weeks ago and I realized there's a level you get at in life where you really don't care what people uh, say again, Tyler Perry is one of my role models when mm. it comes to that. Uh, but usually when people criticize some of what I've done, even including my assistant that came today, most of the time I try to look for an iota of truth in what they're saying mm. and still, you know, adjust. To a large extent, I've missed, you know, the criticism. Someone accused me recently, yeah, you're a bully. And, and I realized, okay, not everything they say is totally wrong. Mm. So I try to take it and then work on it. And the me that you see today is definitely more patient of a person than the me of two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. Because I've been able to take criticism like, you know, uh, fertilizer or feces and then made it, <laughs> made my rose garden grow mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. so I don't take it too seriously and I try not to let it affect my person. Mm -hmm. uh, but I take the outer of truth in it and, you know, see how I can become a better person and usually I end up, recently I was thinking, ah, I can imagine the 80 year old Shenwaki Sonnen giving advice to people. <laughs> and to have been a lot of, you know, implementing some of the criticism that people yeah, gave me. Giving you, wow, wow, we've actually run out of time. It's like, <laughs> it's like nothing happened. But please tell us about how we can get your book, how we can reach you as well. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think my experience in U.S., you know, made me realize the importance of getting this book on Amazon.com because mm. they are like the number one distributor yeah. worldwide. So this book is actually a documentation of my challenges and success story in the past 20 years. And, you know, the first chapter even gives a view of what maybe the year 2025 will be for me. I try to help people document what you think 10, 20 years mm -hmm. from now will be. Most people haven't. Mm -hmm. So it's like a guide because this mm -hmm. is not what we're taught in schools. True. We're taught business admin in school by people that have not run a business yeah. before. 
So this is a real life guy by a fellow Nigerian. Mm. Nigeria is the most uh, populous black country on earth and I feel many people can relate with that. So mm. it's available online on Amazon.com and on Konga and my contact details are there for people who want to take mentorship yeah. seriously. Yeah, yeah, I just want to say it's also available on Roving Heights. I got mine in like less than one day. <laughs> so really? Yeah, oh, that's really so cool. I think we're having better distribution yeah. systems yeah, as well. well. Yeah. All right, well, we have come to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for everything you so shared. I, I got so much from it, but one of the things that I'm learning personally that I think you're reiterating is mentorship mm -hmm. in every part of in your life. Part. Like, in every part. Like, literally, the silliest thing for me is, like, yeah. even, like, um, housekeeping or something like that. Or, like, or parenting. making your hair. Sometimes parenting. you think you know it all, but mm -hmm. as a parent, you need a mentor. You need a mentor. Yeah. You need a mentor, and that's one thing that I'm taking away. Yeah, that's definitely what I'm taking away as well. And just the idea of humility and learning learning from your mistakes, but also learning from other people. And yeah, I think this book is so rich as well. So yeah. thank you for gifting us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, that has been today's episode of The Heart of the Matter. Please join us on social media. Let us know what you think. Have you read the book? Have you been to prison? <laughs> what are you learning? Let us know on our social media platforms. We are on Instagram and Facebook at HOTM TV. And we are on YouTube at HOTM channel. See you next time.